Over the years, there have been two consistent topics that I've always talked about. The pyramid race, their origin and transformation from physical to spiritual or non-physical bodies, and the gardener and winnower, the true masters of the light and darkness. As you can see, this video is going to be all about the winnower, my interpretation of him at the very least. But in the Destiny community, that name means many things. Some people believe that the Winnower straight up doesn't exist. Some people think that the Winnower is the Witness. And some people think that the Winnower is this character here, represented by the statues of the Veiled Woman. Well, in this video, I'll be using the lore from Destiny 1 and 2, with a sprinkle of my own interpretations and guesses to tell you everything that I am aware of when it comes to the character that is the Winnower. But before I get into the nitty gritty, I do want to talk about one thing really quickly. Something new that has come into the mix is, of course, the Veil. Now, is this entity, object, thingmajiggy, darkness related? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's kind of tied to how we got Strand, right? But is it Winnower related? If it's purely paracausal and there's nothing about it that's man-made, then it kind of has to be, right? Do I understand how it ties into what I'll be talking about today? Honestly, no. But that's okay. Mainly because the veil is still super vague, let's be honest. And anything that I would say about it would be purely speculative at this point. So yeah, I won't be talking about the veil in this video. Just what I know or am somewhat confident about. Okay, cool. Now, I want to blitz through some basic questions. Cool, this is going to be fun. What is the Winnower? The Winnower is the master of the force that is the darkness. He is the co-creator of the universes, including the one that the story of destiny takes place in. What does he want? He wants the final shape, which is a universe where only he remains. Everything else is dead or perhaps taken, but he is all that's left, truly. What is his personality like? I would say that he is seemingly charismatic, but with a god complex and a massive ego. It is kind of deserved to be fair. Does he have allies? So his followers are the Taken, the Hive under the God of War, Zivu or Wrath, the Worm Boys, the Black Fleet, kinda, the Witness, what's left of the, okay, yeah, what's left of the Shadow Legion, basically, I mean, you're probably really counting the Purple Legion, and the Scorn. Yeah, throw in some Vex, some Edgelord Guardians, and that's about it. Who is his enemy, you might ask? Everyone else. How powerful is he? I genuinely believe that this character is the most powerful being in the entire Destiny universe. And I also believe, and I'll be showing this, that the Collapse proved that. And that's just the really basic stuff out of the way. Now we're at the part where we actually go digging and getting those really cool details. Let's do it. So let's do these questions again, but actually go in depth. Who is the Winnower? Okay, so before I get into who this character is, the origin, the motivations, I'm gonna throw a common theory that's out there into the bin bag. If you disagree with me, that's fine, but I encourage you to at least think about what I'm gonna say. There is a belief that the term Winnower was just created as a metaphor and nothing else. So basically, there will never be a character with this name or a backstory that's linked to the unveiling lore book. We'll be talking about that a lot, actually. I've seen this logic used in the argument that the Winnower is the Witness, for example. There is, though, one simple reason why I do not believe this theory. 
The whole metaphor argument comes from the nature of, again, the lore book unveiling. But I look beyond it, and I'm going to explain that now. You see, a lot of people don't necessarily believe that the events of, say, the flower game in that lore book are anything more than like a parable or a story, a message, right? And that it wasn't an actual historical event that happened. And so, if you believe that these events were purely made up to be a message, for example, then you would presumably believe that the names of the two characters, Gardener and Winnower, involved would also just be purely contained to that said message or metaphor. The problem is that they're not. Now, I am a bit of a stickler when it comes to the old lore of Destiny, right? I know Bungie doesn't have the best track record in keeping things, you know, continued and in line and all that, but personally, I don't believe in Bungie, well, maybe it's Copium, in Bungie just retconning all of the core lore in Destiny 1 and then making new things now. Like, sure, they might have added in things to fill in certain gaps, like, say, Savvy being at the Collapse, or the introduction of the Witness before the Winnower. But I refuse to accept the notion that just because some old lore doesn't make sense for your theory, that it must not be canon anymore. I say that because I want, I want you to keep all of this in mind when I show you some lore now. I said that the names and the concepts of a gardener and winnower were not contained in Unveiling. Now, as far as I know, the name winnower hasn't been seen much since Unveiling or outside of it. Yes, you did have the name come up in the Witch Queen Collector's Edition lore, but again, that was just a reference to Unveiling. That was like Korra or somebody else talking about Unveiling and the character inside of that. But the same can't be said for the gardener. And these two characters are so linked together, you can't have one without the other. I will probably do a Gardener video at some stage. It won't be as big as this one because the Gardener is a little bit more straightforward. But because these two characters, again, are so linked together, some Gardener lore is just bound to spill into this video and vice versa. I believe that we know what the Gardener looks like, at least the form she can choose to take. And I believe that we have lore about the Gardener in both Destiny 1 and 2. In the Destiny 1 Grimoire card, Ghost Fragment Mysteries, Rasputin talks about how he tried and failed to 1v1 the darkness during the Collapse. It's a bad habit of his. Now, he doesn't know what the darkness is, okay? He doesn't know the concept of the Winnower or even something like the Pyramid Ships, right? Especially when we look later at the Awoken lore, the Deep, or the Darkness, seems to be a formless gravity-destroying force. I mean, when you have a bit being called the Formless one, it kind of makes sense, right? So, in this lore that I'm going to be talking about, Rasputin simply refers to the Darkness as It. So, in this lore, he's talking about how he tried all his weapons and toys, and It was just like, nah, mate. And Rasputin casually mentions him letting humanity get genocided, nice, nice. But then there's this. It is alone, and it is strong, and it won. Even over the gardener, and she held power beyond me. But the gardener did not shrug and make herself alone. It always wins. So there you go, that's the gardener. I I'm sorry, but there's no other possible character that this could be. A being called the gardener that Rasputin says has power beyond him, a being that refused to abandon humanity during the Collapse, and a being that it was able to overcome and beat. He has to be talking about the Traveler, which the Gardener is very much connected to. You look at this Grimoire card, maybe written in like 2012, 2013, do I think this is retconned lore? I certainly don't think so. So what is the purpose of me showing you old D1 lore? about the Gardener, in a video that's supposed to be about the Winnower. I believe that the characters and character concepts of the Gardener and the Winnower have existed within Bungie's understanding and vision since before Destiny 1 came out. Especially because the Grimoire card I just read out was created before the game released. Possibly, again, 2012, early 2013, because the game, the game got delayed. It was supposed to launch in 2013. This is my belief. 
You don't have to agree with me on this, but this is the logic I use when forming my theories and opinions, and I'm, I'm, I do think it's pretty solid. Oh, and as a fun add-on, while this isn't confirmed to be lore from the Winnower, it is suspicious enough for me to mention. This is Ghost Fragment Darkness 4, also from Vanilla Destiny 1. This war is all there is for you. What else do you have? You walk among mortals and immortals, a creature lost in time. Your only purpose is the struggle. Does it seem unfair? Be brought back into this. The end of days, the long dwindling exhalation of an ancient corpse. You were at peace. Now, you are a dead husk charged with war. Do you remember anything of freedom? Fight on then. The war is everything. But consider the choices before you. Again, listen, I can't confirm that this is from the winnower. But when you take everything that I say, that I have said, and I will say into account, as well as using your own smart, you're smart people, right? Okay, you're, you're all a bunch of lore nerds, right? That's why we're all here, okay? It is actually pretty suspicious. And I'm just going to leave it at that. My next point, all right, is that the winnower is represented as a male character. Now, this is a fun one. I, I, I always and I keep calling the character a he. And I feel like that does trigger some people. So I, I do figure it makes sense that I explain why. Most people who have looked at the lore surrounding the gardener pretty much all agree that she takes the form of a woman. Now, obviously, she isn't human, but you know what I'm trying to say here. But what about the winnower? Why am I saying that a character known as the formless one is represented as a male character? I simply say it because that is what the evidence implies. That, that, that's purely it. Marasov to the Kell of the House of Wolves. She says, Starlight was my mother, and my father was the Dark. And remember this when we get to the Marasena lore book. You look at this character, who was most likely the Gardener, and you see the striking similarities with this character. I think it's safe to say that this concept art is of the Gardener. And who is next to this character? This guy with a sword that I have made a video about already. I believe that this character represents the Winnower. I do. Listen, I'm not saying that he'll look like this in game, of course. It's been so many years, but the concept is what matters to me. It's the exact same thing with this picture here. People have said that it is completely irrelevant because it's never appeared in game, but that's not the point. It's the concept that matters. This picture alone told me years ago that the pyramid race met the gardener, had a golden age, and turned on her. My ancient eldritch theory video and my stream clip did the pyramid race worship the traveler goes into it. If you're still not convinced, there's the deep stone crypt raid gear lore. Yeah, we've got some D2 lore now. Let's go. Listen, I'm not an encyclopedia. I don't like reading out tons of lore pages. I know when I watch lore videos and then the guy reads out the stuff i just pause the video and read the text and skip for it I know. but this page i think is so significant and yet i see nobody talking about it and if they do they do triple expert world record front flips for front flips through so many hoops to get as far away as they can from what i feel is really just the the easiest explanation in the lore tab for Legacy Oaths Mark. Saint-14 is having one of his exo dreams, you know, the ones linked to the crypt, and he's 1v9ing against a bunch of Vex. Listen to this excerpt, and tell me what you think in the comments below. Well, I mean, I'm gonna tell you what I think afterwards, but you know, whatever. Bro, can that bird shut up? I will turn you into a hat, bro. I will actually skin you. But then, the night before a new vacuum of grief was opened in the system, a woman appeared at the threshold of the tower. Her clothes were black, her hair prematurely gray. She watched, arms crossed, as Saint hurled grenade after flaming grenade at the Vex with little effect. You'll blind yourself with all that bright fire, she tutted. Maybe then 
you'll finally learn to look instead of see. In one mighty swipe, the Vex cut the Exo down. The woman sighed as Saint crumpled to the ground. Silence fell, followed by the crunch of footsteps in the snow. Just like your father, she said, kneeling by his head. All of you. She laid a hand on the fore of his helm, as if feeling for a fever. In your next life, you should take after me. With that, her hand slid down to his eyes, and for a brief moment before he woke up, all was dark. Okay, there is a lot to unpack here. The key thing is that I do believe that this mysterious woman is the gardener. Notice how she potentially just stopped the Vex in that dream or simulation, whatever you want to call it. If these were real Vex, I mean, Clovis had very little control over living Vex as a whole. I mean, yeah, he captured some of them, experimented, good for him, but against the actual Vex collective, nah. Just a point I'm making. Her appearance does actually tie in with the gardener, and I actually think there's a very logical explanation for why she looks slightly different to previous iterations of the character. And I'm going to mention this in my gardener video whenever I make it, but prematurely gray, the hair, black clothing, this is a post-collapse gardener we're looking at. She seemingly took Saint out of the dream and let him have a peaceful sleep, and that is very significant for Exos. And finally, she refers to his next life, which I believe is a purely guardian thing. Oh yeah, sure, you can talk about Exos getting their minds wiped, but that's a bit wishy-washy. And I highly doubt we'll be seeing a Saint 15 anytime soon. Also, the problem she has with Saint's behavior is seemingly connected to all of you. Not every Exo is a warrior and driven to fight as much as Saint, Cade, Lisbon, or other named guardian Exos are. Ada, Banshee, and, and Lakshmi are some examples of that. I know you can say Ada doesn't really count, but maybe you will. Yeah. Lore from Destiny 1 even ties the warrior nature to guardians specifically. Legend, the Black Garden Grimoire, has the line, You are a dead thing made by a dead power in the shape of the dead. All you will ever do is kill. I'm just saying, right? These things are kind of connecting together, right? It's like connect the dots. Is okay. And then we have the most important line. Just like your father. First of all, if there's a quote-unquote father character, then I believe that the woman is the mother character, as she wants Saint to turn away from the life that follows the nature of his father in order to live more like her. You can call this a stretch, but when you look at how she treats him, like here in this line, she laid a hand on the fore of his helm, as if feeling for a fever. In my opinion, that's a very motherly thing to do. Okay, so let's just assume. Just, 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 just humor me. This woman is the mother figure. So who is the father? <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Yeah, you do, yeah, you do, you do, you do. So why do I believe that the father figure is the winner? Well, the father's nature... Okay, seems to be the opposite of the mother's. And this nature is represented by how Saint-14 and all of you act. Saint-14's nature is that of a warrior. He fights the Vex even though he knows he's going to lose. The war is all there is. You see what I did there? Now, you might think that this is just because he's an Exo and Exos were created originally for war. But not me. When the woman says that this behavior is linked to a father and all of you, I don't believe she is talking about Clovis and the Exos, but rather the Guardians slash Risen and the Winnower. I already went over this point, I know, but it is important to hammer it home. As a side note, and we will get into this later, the Winnower being portrayed as a father to the Risen has actually been seen before. In the unveiling lore book, the Winnower straight up says that he was responsible for making us humanity. And get this, you'll love it. Listen to this line. I truly value you to the gardener 
You are a means to an end. To me, you are majestic. Majestic. You are full of the only thing worth anything at all. The Winnower says that he is responsible for making us, humanity, and then says that to him, we, the Risen, are majestic, majestic, and that we are full of the only thing worth anything at all. I know it's repeated the quote before. Well, what if I told you that in the books of sorrow, the Deep, aka the Winnower, says that he is the final shape and that it is majestic, majestic. He says he's majestic, majestic. Says we're majestic, majestic. We're full of the only thing that ever matters, but of uh, he thinks that he's the only thing that matters. Blah, blah, blah. If you haven't seen the link, I'll just say it. The fatherhood theme is really, really strong here. Okay, okay, okay. Phew. I just get excited sometimes. I'm sorry, right? I nerd out. One of the few things left in this game's lore I actually care about now. So, to recap, I've explained why the concept of the characters known as the Gardener and the Winnower are not contained to unveiling, but in fact have roots reaching as far back as potentially Vanilla D1. I also explained why I believe the Winnower is represented as a male figure and, on top of all of that, showed that as the Gardener is in a way a mother to the Guardians, the Winnower also values us in a way that almost a father would. Cool. Nice. So, from now on, if I show this boy, and I call him the Winnower, and I call the Winnower a boy, that's why. Okay? Nice. So, with all of that being said, I'm now going to tell you the Winnower's origin story, and how this has shaped his motivations. Awesome. Let's do it. I made a video called The Final Shape, as explained by the lore, or something like that. But I'm going to go much further with this. Right? This is, this is the fun bit. Okay, cool. I've said this so many times on the channel, and that's that the Winnower is the final shape, or at least that he sees himself as the final shape. I'm going to explain the concept of the final shape, and I'm also going to explain how I believe the Winnower came to have this belief, which is something that you might find interesting. The final shape, what is it? A bunch of characters have thrown a bunch of definitions out there, and I am 100% not going to go through all of them. Bro, this bird, I will get the shotgun. What is the final shape? The end state of the destiny universe. What is it for the winnower? The final shape is a universe where only the strong remain. It's basically a universe where all life is forced to live or die rather under the sword logic. The problem with this is that nobody can stay strong forever. And I see Oryx dying, and Savvy becoming desperate to free herself from her worm. That's good examples of this. In time, everyone will eventually fall under the category of not being strong enough. And so they'll die to make room for life that is strong. Until in the end, only the Winnower will remain. And to be clear, as to why I know this is the case. Books of Sorrow, verse 32, the Winnower says, strip away the lies and truces and delaying tactics they call civilization, and this is what remains, this beautiful shape. Skip ahead a bit. This is the universe figuring out what it should be in the end. And it is majestic, majestic. It is the only thing that can be true in and of itself. And it is what I am. So that's why I believe that the Winnower is the final shape. Also, it just makes sense. Oh, the final shape from his perspective. Now, when you look at the Winnower in the universe of destiny right now, and you look at all the forces that directly or indirectly serve him, this is the true motivation behind all of it. It's why the Hive wiped out countless worlds and empires. It's why the Scorn genocided their own race, the Fallen. It's why Golden Ages always get shut down. And it's why the Winnower wants the Gardener out of the picture. In the end, everything is moving towards wiping the universe clean of what the Winnower doesn't like. And creating a clean slate. This is his end goal. 
but it wasn't always. I'm now going to go back to the lore book unveiling, which, in case some of you don't know, did come out with Shadowkeep. In this lore book, the Winnower lays out his argument as to why he's right and the Gardener is wrong. And it all goes back to the flower game. I said it before, and I'll say it again. I'm not going to read out all the lore pages. You're smart people. There's, I'd say there's a good chance that a lot of you have read this book before anyways. That being said, okay, that being said, if there are some of you who want the source material, I will have a link to the lore referenced in the description below. Also, I'm going to simplify the crap out of this lore. So apologies if that's triggering to you, but I just want to break it down as much as possible and keep things brief and concise. Because this is not a brief and concise video. No, it's not. Okay. Unveiling. What happened? Before the Destiny universe was created in the Black Garden, the original Black Garden, the Winnower and the Gardener tended to life there. The Gardener nurtured all life, helped it grow, and the Winnower killed off the Chaff, or the weak life. That is the bare bones answer. That line, the one I just read about the Chaff and the life and whatever, at its core, that actually shows the purpose of these characters. Remember, as far as we know, they weren't created by an intelligent being. It was random mathematical chance. So this purpose is hardwired into them. It is all they know, and I would argue, it is all they're good for. These aren't humans, they aren't people. They existed, and they exist, with one purpose. It was what defined them then, and it is what defines them now. In the garden, they would play a game. It was called the flower game. This is, the this is the simple part here. Here we go. You had a big grid <laughs> with tons of flowers. The idea of the game was to see how each flower would end up. Depending on the actions it took, depending on the types of neighbors it had, its positioning in the grid, etc., it would either live and grow, or it would die. And long story short, the game always ended the same way, with everything except one particular pattern of flowers dying. And this winning pattern was driven solely by the will to survive. And so it consumed and annihilated everything else. And it was the way it ended every single time. I've heard from a few people that this pattern turned into the Vex in the Destiny universe. And yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Just look at their behavior and motivations in the lore. So you have this game and it always ends the same way. And the gardener didn't like this mainly because the game always ended this way, and she found that to be boring. Fair enough. So, she decided to change the rules, so that other patterns could have a chance in the game. The Winnower freaked out when she said this. He claimed that this changing of the rules wouldn't necessarily change the ending of the game, but it would add chaos and suffering to it. What ended up happening? The Winnower and the Gardener ultimately did two things, and it is important that we distinguish the two from each other. One, they became part of the game. Two, they created the universes. The key thing that you need to understand. It's not a choice you have to, this is, you have to know this, <laughs> is that one of these actions was intentional on both sides. And the other was an accident. The two characters became parts of the game as a result of their argument. The gardener wanted to guarantee that the game would end differently. And so she put herself into the game as a force that gave power and strength to life that might normally get nuked otherwise. Okay? Golden ages. And the winnower became part of the game pretty much to oppose the gardener. To see that the game ended the same way as it always had. And he would achieve this by doing the same thing that he had always done. Be a winnower. Except, instead of just culling weak life, he was also culling life positively affected by the gardener. To make this as simple as possible, this is my interpretation. The winnower and gardener have one purpose ingrained in them. They became parts of the game and used their purposes to get the end of the game that they wanted. So, if the gardener got her way, the game would begin to end differently. She'd give power-ups to patterns, 
and there would be a bit more unpredictability involved. And if the win over won, then the game would just end the same way every single time. And I, I see this happening by him using his purpose and his power to kill or undo any life that had been changed by the gardener. I think that's pretty clear. I hope so anyway. Now this brings us to point number two. The Winnower attacked the gardener and they fought in the Black Garden. The clash of two beings as powerful as them in a place where life and death were they're so dependent on their actions caused the universes to be born. Effectively the Big Bang. Okay, that's what that's what Bungie's going up, you know, with this. It's the Big Bang. Okay, cool. The Gardener, the Winnower, and the original pattern that had normally won the game ended up in the universe of destiny. Unlucky. This action was an accident. The Gardener was not prepared to fight the Winnower, and the Gardener did not agree to fight the Winnower. Both of them also didn't know what the consequence of their fight would be, as they had never fought before. Now, they're in a brand new universe where all of reality is held together by their combined power, the light and darkness. And there's tons of life being born, free to live however it wants. And the winning pattern is no longer the winning pattern because this is a new grid and new game with new rules and two very powerful new players. Assuming that this pattern was the Vex in the Destiny universe, they stopped being the guaranteed final shape once the rules of the game changed. I'm not saying it's impossible for them to win. I'm just saying that once it was set in stone, but now it isn't. Unlucky. The gardener gets straight to work, boosting different races and giving them golden ages, blah, 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 you get the yeah, cool. I'm sure the creation of the traveler uh, happened somewhere in this era, but there's no info on that, so oh well. However, the winnower looks at all of this and his motivation changes. Remember, what did the winnower originally want? For the original game, to end the same way every time. He wanted things to go back to the way they were, to balance, to logic, to majesty, except now there's an untamed universe. And to him, it's all a mistake. Strong life and weak life are free from his immediate control here. And in the eyes of the winnower, this means weak life is suffering for the duration of its existence and being a burden to strong life in the process. And because the Vex are no longer the guaranteed winning pattern, the end is unpredictable. And if in the end there is life that does endure long enough to be the winners of the quote unquote game that is existence, how can the winner be satisfied with that ending when there's a good chance that this life was influenced and empowered by the gardener? Now the gardener is delighted by all of this. Life is free no longer predictable with the endings and she will do her best to make all life in the universe thrive and grow and be happy and blah 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 but all the winnower can think about is that there is no true final shape and that there is just chaos the winnower is disgusted by this universe he is disgusted by this crude version of the game he looks to its future to the end, and decides that he must become it. That right there is the origin story of the Winnower folks, why he is the way he is, and why he wants what he wants. He tolerates followers who live by his logic, as it is the winning strategy of the game after all. He even grows fond of those who devote themselves to it, like his man Oryx. But deep down, he and they know that they will all fall before they can reach the end. To quote Rolk, the final abyss awaits them all. The personality of the Winnower. Does it even have one? Well, I am here to say that yes, he does. And all things considered, he's a pretty chill guy. We have potentially four instances of the Winnower talking. When they talked to the gardener in Unveiling, when they talked to us in Unveiling, when they talked to Oryx in the Books of Sorrow, and of course, that Sus Grimoire card I showed you earlier. There's actually also, I'm literally reading off a teleprompter thing. I just had a bingus light bulb moment. 
uh, in the collector's edition of Shadowkeep or something like that, there was that picture of the pyramids and whatever, and it said, she will bow to me. I think that was the winner. Okay, cool. Nice. Possible option there. So when the winnower talks to the gardener in unveiling, they're very formal. There's not really a hint of friendship or anything like that. And um, the only thing that you get is just what they want, right? And we've already we've already gone over that, okay? It's just formal, straight to the point. And I'll be honest with you, there isn't much of a personality that you can take away from the language here. But I thought I'd mention it anyway. But that completely changes when we move forward to the books of sorrow the winnower is an absolute chad here something that i i keep reminding myself and i think people need to remember this is that oryx had to go through a lot to be able to communicate with the winnower he had to find out where the deep was figure that all out he had to kill his siblings to be strong enough to face akka he had to kill the worm god akka to find out how to communicate with the deep and then he had to read off the Tablets of Ruin just to be able to travel into the Deep. On top of all of that, the lore says that every time Oryx tried to communicate with the Deep, he had to basically challenge all of existence by saying that he was the strongest life in the universe. So, he's in the Deep. He's talking to what really is his true god. A being that he has followed and watched cause destruction beyond that of even the hive. And what is, what's the first thing this being says to him? Oryx, my king, my friend, kick back, relax. The winnower in this lore is so unbelievably relaxed and chill. Ah, Oryx, how do we explain it to them? It's great, it really is. Uh, you, maybe I'm just a fanboy, right? I think it's great writing, but anyways, after observing this language, what do I get when it comes to the personality of the winnower? Okay, we got our three points here. Respect, self-righteousness, and arrogance. Let's go through them. Respect. The winnower might seem to be a merciless villain. A big meanie. But there is no chance that he didn't respect Oryx. Out of every character I have ever seen, there is no truer servant of the sword logic than Oryx. The witness might be on paper more powerful, uh, but salvation in and of itself is not in the sword logic's dictionary. Until the term gets more explanation, the witness will stay in the corner. Also, Lightfall showed us that, wit the <laughs> that the witness is perfectly fine with necromancy as shown through Nezric. The dude dies and he comes back he dies, and he comes back, he dies, and he- This was one of the reasons I was so set on Nezarek not being a disciple. Not just because I'm a Nezarek simp or fanboy. If- Because if the Witness was a true follower of the sword logic, they wouldn't tolerate a character like Nezarek at all. And on top of that, the actual prophecy of Nezarek had them have both different end goals in mind. Yeah. Do you know what Nezarek's sin is? I don't know what Nezarek's sin is. It's actually kind of depressing. Whereas when Oryx's son, Nocris practiced necromancy, Oryx lost his mind. He banished him and wipes like 99.55% of his son's presence or history from Hive Records. That, that is what a true follower of the sword logic would do. Even the winnower says that personally he wouldn't have made the guardians right because we're you know we're from dead people so it's kind of necromancy it's, like, it's just not in my nature but like i i just listen i'm sorry I, I just wouldn't do that right not only has oryx time and time again demonstrated his devotion to the sword logic but he literally only died because it required him to face all challengers that was literally the point of the court of oryx and the king's fall raid by the way king's fall only happened because the king opened the gate to his castle. Remember that. I believe the Winnower saw all of this sacrifice and devotion and thought to himself, finally, that guy gets it. So when Oryx is finally worthy to be in his presence, why not treat him as a friend? At the same time, Oryx was living proof 
of the sword logic strength. So I would say the winnower was pretty happy with that as well. Not only does the winnower treat Oryx with respect in Destiny 1 lore, but in Unveiling, released in Shadowkeep, the winnower says my favorite line of my man Oryx. Even though Oryx was long dead by this point, the winnower looked back fondly at the Taken King. And of course, it, it goes without saying, but the winnower spoke with respect to us in that same lore book. I mean, he said he valued us, and I don't believe he was lying, I do not, especially with the connection I made between the word majestic and himself, that's a word he uses for himself, not something he uses lightly, and yet he says that this is what we are too. And as a side note, I actually believe that this is also a hint towards the real final shape. <laughs> which is the one where we kill or get rid of both the Gardener and the Winnower, freeing the universe from their influence. But anyway, moving on. The next point, we, we covered, right? The, the dude has respect for certain people. Okay, cool. The second point is self-righteousness. A common theme that exists between Unveiling and the Books of Sorrow is the certainty that the Winnower has in his vindication. He isn't just doing this for the giggles. Do you see a giggle here? He truly believes that he is right. In the Books of Sorrow, the Winnower gives a big speech about why the sword logic is right to Oryx. Now, let's just, just pause, pause just to think about it, right? Okay. Look, even, even the birds have stopped being annoying. They're, they're, they're thinking, right? After everything that I have just said, do you think Oryx needed to hear that? Do, did, did he need convincing? Do you think he was the right one to give that whole spiel to? N not really, no. But let's look at why this is what the winner chose to say. Apart from, I don't know, I guess the witness, I really hate that character. Apart from them, there's a good chance that the winner has never directly spoken to another being outside of perhaps the gardener, right? Like what other character has gotten to that level of power. Like, I mean, I guess it's the worm gods, but I, I don't know. Keep that in mind, and let's go back to his motivations. Why is the winner doing what he's doing? Is he power hungry? Is he sadistic? Is he just a big meanie? Nah. He believes that he's doing the right thing. That when he kills weak life, it's not just because it's what he seemingly is, was made to do, but because he is preventing that life from suffering anymore. And then by extension, he is helping strong life by freeing it from a burden. The winner wants to create a universe that is free from weakness, because weakness leads to suffering. And quite frankly, life is suffering. <laughs> okay. But, you know, you get what I mean, you get what I mean. In the Black Garden, he tried to reason with the gardener, tried to stop her from destroying the balance that was precious in his eyes. But she ignored him. She forced his hand. One line in particular stands out. This is the main line of this part of the video. And they call us evil. Evil. Evil means socially maladaptive. We are adaptiveness itself. You can hear the scorn and bitterness in that line. Like, he is greatly offended by that label. And personally, I wouldn't blame him. If there is one thing that the franchise that is Destiny has consistently told us, it is that good and evil cannot be given easy labels like light and darkness. The objection to the word evil, and the immediate counter argument to me at least, it shows a character who is logically minded and who believes in right and wrong through the coldest of logic, as sharp as a sword, pun intended. Okay, so that's the Wafflemeister in me coming out. Just moving on, you get what I'm saying? When you take this conversation with Oryx and the conversation with the gardener and the conversation with us, it is clear that the winner believes he is doing the right thing. And he is willing to be labeled as a villain because of it. Because in the end, the voices that cry out in anger only got to exist in the first place because of him. Think about that. The universe has only existed because of the winner. Now, maybe I'm looking too deep into it, but that, that, that is what I do. When you take a being as powerful as the winner, who believes they're doing the right thing, 
and you put them in a universe where they are constantly labeled as evil and a monster, one way to push forward is to become arrogant. Has there ever been a golden age that didn't fall to the sword logic? No. Has there ever been a force that beat the hive when they were at full strength? No. Did the gardener win at the collapse? Not a chance. The traveler was attacked by the Black Fleet at Io, and it was strong enough to make it back to Earth. But when the Winnower arrived in the system, the lore book Marasana clearly states that when the light and darkness clashed, the light was not quite strong enough. It could not vanquish the shadow. All right, let's go into detail here. This is this 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 is the, this is the fun bit, right? Like I'm basically like using the lore to create like the perfect argument that you can't counter because if you counter, then you're saying that Bungie's wrong and Bungie's never okay. Right? Anyway, the Exodus Green, the colony ship that had the asleep soon to be awoken, is far from Earth, though still it's it's still inside the solar system. Long story short, the collapse begins, and the ship is conscripted by Rasputin to change course and provide support as long-range artillery. The captain asks where the Traveler is, and the answer is that it's on Earth, and that there are heavy weapons going off. While this is going on, a strange anomaly follows them and catches up. Gravity goes absolutely nuts, and although they can't actually see what this thing is, all the stars go out and it's pitch black. This moment is actually referenced in the Stars in Shadow Pulse Rifle. There are people, plenty I'd say, who believe that this anomaly was the Black Fleet. But it literally has to be the Winnower. And I'm going to use the lore, lore as recent as Lightfall, to prove that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. If there's anything that Lightfall is good for, maybe this is it, who knows. Here's the thing, the collapse hadn't just started when this was going on. Because remember, from Destiny 2 lore, the Traveler was attacked by the Black Fleet first on Io. And then from Io, the Traveler beelined it and went to Earth. So, if the Traveler is on Earth, when the Exodus Green hears about the collapse, then it's already been more than like 30 seconds since it began. At the same time, same, same time, we learned from either Season of Plunder or Seraph that Nezarek led the Collapse, including, of course, the Black Fleet. And like I said, the Black Fleet went first to Io and then followed the Traveler to Earth. And at the same, same, same time, it, it is ridiculous, no offense, to claim that the pyramids can cause this gravity and star-blocking phenomena when we have never once seen them do this. Easy, easiest example is here, right? Seems bright to me. Any instance you see them, they never, ever display this kind of behavior. And when the whole fleet, the whole fleet is above Earth in Lightfall, in like seemingly the final battle, there's nothing gravity related to happening at all. The stars are fine. It, they they, they kind of just sit there, being honest with you. So it could not have been the pyramids because, well, we know for a fact they couldn't have been there. We know where they were and we know why they were there. At the same time, the anomaly's behavior has never been seen before or since that part of the lore, to the best of my knowledge, right? And I'm sure some lore lovers will point out Titan and how during the collapse, this massive god wave was risen to like wipe out everything. And I would say that was also the winnower. You see, Lightfall was not the second collapse. It was a continuation of the first one. It was the witness finishing what they started. The plan was clearly always to link the veil to the traveler, okay? And the veil was with the fleet, with Nazarek. And we know this because Savathun killed him, I hate that, and took it from him. Yes, this also proves that the hive were in the same place as the fleet, so they couldn't have been the tsunami thing. So if the goal was always to pin down the traveler, use the veil, why waste time on colonies? What? What's the point? By doing that, you lose the element of surprise. No, think about it. The pyramids, if they beat the traveler, what are the colonies going to do to them anyway? They can take their time afterwards. By wasting time on the colonies on the way to the traveler, you lose the element of surprise. 
This is just basic common sense. There's a reason why the collapse started on Io, because that was where the Traveler was. Guess what? Titan is further away from Earth than Io is. Titan is a moon of Saturn, Io is a moon of Jupiter. If the fleet wasted its time attacking Titan, the Traveler would have been made aware of their presence and would have fled. Instead, they went straight for Io and caught the Traveler with its pants down while it was terraforming. Y you know who, you know who does care about wiping out Golden Age colonies, though. Yeah, you do. You, you know. You already know. Yeah. Okay. It is my belief that while the Black Fleet, under the witness Savvy, Nazarek, and the other disciples, fought the Traveler at Earth. The Winnower was wiping clean all the colonies of our solar system, and that is what the Exodus Green encountered. Okay, cool, right? You know, I can just say that they encountered the Winnower at the edge of the system or whatever, and but people are gonna say, well, how do you know? I gotta explain these things, man, and that's what this video is all about. So this is what the Exodus Green encountered. And then they get front row seats as the gardener squares up to him. Okay. A point of pure white shines in the cosmic distance, not just visible luminance, but light in the radio bands, in microwave, keening ultraviolet, a spike of gamma, a total and all-embracing radiation. It sings, it chatters, it speaks in a voice older than suns. It is awesome and appalling and piercingly true. The light pierces the darkness. Not like the sunrise, not like a wall or a flood, but a single crepuscular, I pronounced that right, shut up, ray. A finger of radiance that reaches out through the deepest night to touch her, her being Mara. But it is not quite enough. It cannot vanquish the shadow. The winnower faced the gardener and over the corpse of humanity was victorious. The colonies were destroyed, humanity was in the process of being wiped out, and the Traveler, weak and surrounded, had nowhere left to run. As far as the Winnower was concerned, the Gardener was no longer a player in the game. But that's when we came in. Risen, with no memories, no moral compass, and the ability to defy and shape reality. The Gardener presented us to the Winnower and made her closing argument. She argued that we, of our own choosing, would live not by the sword logic, but by her logic. That we wouldn't kill the weak, but protect them. That we wouldn't burn cities, but raise them. The Winnower's ultimate argument is that the sword logic is the right way, because it is the natural way. The way of the original garden. We are the gardener's proof that he is wrong. At least we can be. After hundreds of years, the time of our final choice is coming. The winnower is heading for us. And he thinks that he's already won. I am, by the only standard that matters, or will ever matter, the winning team. Don't hurry to deliver your answer. I'll come over and hear it myself. After observing this language, and tying it to the fact that the Winnower has technically never lost a fight or argument in his life. I would say it's safe to believe that the Winnower is arrogant, and rightfully so. He might not have begun that way, but after thousands of years of being proven right, and after winning the Collapse, he literally cannot see himself losing. So, to summarize the Winnower's personality, he respects the strong, especially those who are both strong and who embrace the sword logic. The respect is conditional and tied with the understanding, mutual or otherwise, that they will, by the end of the universe, die. He is logically minded and self-righteous in his mind. The gardener is responsible for all the pain and suffering that has ever existed. And just like when they fought, he sees the destruction he causes in our universe as more blood on her hands. The Winnower sees our universe and wants to rid it all of suffering. He truly believes that he is doing the right thing and that he is the hero of this story. That is why he gets irritated when the ignorant incorrectly use terms like evil or monster in regard to him. Because logically, 
but that just isn't true at all. And then finally, the Winnower is extremely arrogant. He might have believed he was right since before the universes were created, but on top of that, this universe has so far done nothing but prove him right. The Hive and Oryx are the best examples of this. For all the effort the Gardener had spent in empowering life, that ascended life was never strong enough to stand against the Hive, for example. So in the end, he was right. Their end wasn't changed, only delayed, and only suffering came out of it. And then in the collapse, he decisively defeated the Gardener, taking her out of the game. Watch my video on why the Traveler never helps us, and you'll see what I mean. He had the chance to destroy her and the Traveler, but chose not to. Why? Because it wasn't enough to stab with the first knife. After all the suffering, all the pain, and all the weakness that he had seen the universe endure, he wanted to twist it. That is why he wants us to join him. Yes, there's the potential fatherhood theme and all that, but at the end of the day, he wants to win by using the gardener's own argument against her. How bitter and ironic would that be? Very long, very thorough, but this is everything that I am aware of when it comes to the winnower's personality, origins, motivations, it is what it is. Of course, some of it is just my interpretation, but this is just what makes sense to me. Before we get to the conclusion, I want to talk about The Witness. The Witness was, for all intents and purposes, introduced in Shadowkeep. That's the voice, the possessed or ghost, and who talks to us in the cutscene at the end. You can see they even have the same hand gesture thing. Now, a lot of the lore about the Winnower that I have talked about came from the lore book Unveiling, which also came from Shadowkeep and technically came from the Lunar Pyramid. You can understand why people would mix up the character in this book and the character in the cutscene. I won't spend too much time on this as I think it deserves its own video, but long story short, we had two villains vaguely introduced in one expansion and a small one at that. Why is that? I have some ideas. Maybe I'll share them sometime. I don't know, but like, let's focus on the witness. What is it? My opinion has always been that it was not the Winnower. I made a video called Do Not Be Deceived After Witch Queen, and I straight up said this is Bungie doing the same thing they did with the Black Fleet and calling it the Darkness. Don't be deceived. The Witness is not the Winnower. The Witness was once mortal. Its people were blessed by the light just like your kind were. In that light, these beings found knowledge and power, but they were not content. In that darkness, these beings found power and knowledge, but they were not content. Power and knowledge turned to greed and despair. The witness was forever changed. My opinion has always been that this being is connected to the race associated with the pyramid ships, the pyramid race. Another long story short, I have always maintained that this race met the gardener, had a golden age, and then turned on her. In the end, mastering the light and the darkness, kind of like what we're doing. I believe that the witness is not a normal person, but a being that has been ascended by the darkness into what they are now, into the child of darkness, which like I said in that other video I mentioned, is basically a dark speaker. I believe the witness is super powerful, sure, but I am confident that the winnower holds its leash and that ultimately it is a pawn in the greater scheme of things. A scheme I think I'll share soon. And yeah, that's that. That is like 90% of my take on the winnower. And more importantly, why I believe it. Pretty much everything that I have said has been backed up by the lore. Like I said, there are some parts that could be wrong for sure and other parts that, in my opinion, can only be wrong if Bungie either retcons or forgets their own lore. Something that I really, really hope doesn't happen. Here's hoping the Winnower doesn't get the Charlemagne treatment. Yeah. But let me know what you think. Do you agree with me?
Tell me why. Do you disagree? Tell me why. And most importantly of all, if you watched to the end of the video, thank you. It's been a very, very long time since I've made a Destiny lore video, and I wanted this to be special. I hope you enjoyed it, finding it either entertaining or informative, and if I hit that wombo combo, maybe both. I'll talk to you all real soon. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye. Then this picture literally makes so much more sense because they went from hieroglyphics to this and it's only because of that.